Good morning. Welcome to the online worship service at Living Savior. We're grateful to have you joining us today. My name is Pastor Caleb Kerbis, along with Pastor Paul Zell, the other pastor here at Living Savior. We are privileged to bring God's word to you today. God's generosity is a wonderful thing when we are on the receiving end. However, what God wants us to analyze today is that God's grace is not just unilateral for us, God's grace is for all. And it's important for us to consider just how gracious our God is, not just when it comes to us, but when it comes to others. In this way, God enables us to analyze just how unworthy we are. We, according to our own lives, don't make ourselves more worthy recipients of God's grace. No, God's grace is just that. It's grace. It's love that God has for us, this predisposed favor toward us just because. And God kind of puts that on the plate today for us to consider. In this parable that Jesus is going to tell, in addition to the sermon lesson we are going to see from the prophet Jonah, God enables us to see just how generous he is for others so that we would see how beautiful this grace is for them and for us all. May God bless our service in his name this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God invites us to come into his presence even in this way. And when we do, he invites us to humbly and transparently confess all of our sins before him, knowing that Jesus, our Savior, has already forgiven all of our sins. Let us contemplate our sins and also plead to God on the basis of his mercy in Christ. Let's do so quietly now. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In God's great mercy, he made us alive in Jesus Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And so God communicates this beautiful truth to me and to you through his word, that our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for today from the prophet Jonah will serve as the basis for the sermon. When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. 
in our gospel reading from today. Jesus puts on the stage, so to speak, this analysis that we have of God's grace. And he wants us to see that God has every right to dole out his mercy to those who might seem undeserving, for we are not the ones who determine who are deserving to God. It is God who does. And in his grace and mercy, he gives us not just a day's wage, but he gives us forgiveness and peace through his son, Jesus Christ. The Gospel from Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was 1938. In the early years of aviation, a fellow named Douglas Corrigan filed his flight plan, assuring the, the authorities that he was going to fly west to California. Early one morning in thick pea soup fog, he took off from a Brooklyn, New York airfield. 29 hours later, he landed in Ireland, which if you know your geography, that's not west of Brooklyn, New York. He told the authorities that he got confused in the fog and that his, his compass didn't work, but nobody believed him. In fact, everybody in the country understood that he wanted to do one of those, one of those daring transatlantic flights. They held a ticker tape per parade for, for, for Douglas Corrigan down Broadway the next day in the in the New York Post across the top of the front page wrong way Corrigan written written backwards were you at one time just as amused with the story of Jonah yeah that that Jonah the the one that God sent to go east to the city of Nineveh and preach against it. That Jonah, the one who instead went down to the coast, got on board a ship so that he could sail as far west as he could possibly go. God sent a, a great storm so violent that the ship they were afraid was breaking up. Jonah goes overboard. He sinks into the waves. The Lord provides a great fish that that, that swallows him alive. He spends three days and three nights in the belly of the fish until the Lord directs the fish to swim close to the shore and it unceremoniously vomits Jonah up on dry ground. For a child, this is entertainment. Even grown-ups might imagine the, the old Disney movie of Pinocchio and Geppetto and, and 
Jiminy Cricket and, and, and the, the, the great whale called Monstro. But, but a prophet of God sailing away from the very people God wanted him to, to reprimand and rescue, a, a child of God turning his back on, on people that would perish without the message that he could share with them, a believer given the opportunity to save fellow sinners and yet pulling a, a wrong way Corrigan and, and, and going in the opposite direction, that's not amusing at all. So does the, does the account of Jonah get any better? Depends on your perspective. You see, after being humiliated by the storm and, and, and rescued by the great fish, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. This time Jonah went east, just as the Lord instructed him. Once he arrived, we imagine Jonah going into busy shops in the commercial area, knocking on doors in residential neighborhoods, stopping passers-by in the street, and, and, and having a conversation with two or, or ten or, or twenty or, or fifty people. And, and the message multiplied. Soon everybody in, in Nineveh had heard his message, which went essentially like this, forty more days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. And remarkably... Amazingly, the Ninevites believed God and turned from their evil ways. Against all odds, they believed that Jonah's message was the message of the one true God. They actually believed that God will punish those guilty of adultery or hatred or or, or gossip, or murder, or, or taking advantage of others, or, or, or simply refusing to give glory to the, to the name of the Creator. They believe that God did have the right to destroy them. But apparently they also believed that given the opportunity to repent, God might, in fact, relent and have mercy on them. And that's exactly what happened. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. That kid in your school who bullies you and humiliates you in front of your classmates. What if God were to give him popularity and success and a long and happy life? That's how Jonah felt. That loudmouth you work with who won't stop bragging about how well he's doing and, and how wonderful his life is. What if, what if God gave him the promotion and authority over you. That's how Jonah felt. That aging Hollywood type who keeps voicing his political opinions that are the polar opposite of yours, what if God gives him a, a blockbuster hit and even more airtime to, to, to voice his, his views? That's how Jonah felt. You see, Jonah was from a, a tiny postage stamps nation known as Israel. In the Old Testament, the only other reference to Jonah tells how at Jonah's time, everyone in Israel was, whether slave or free, was suffering. Meanwhile, Nineveh was this great big bully of an empire. Jonah didn't want them to be blessed with prosperity and, and, and a long and happy history. The ruler of, of Nineveh no doubt could brag about how well equipped and vast his armies were. Jo Jonah didn't want him to be given success and the opportunity to boast even further. Nineveh and its empire had actually been in decline for several decades 
Jonah didn't want the Lord to to turn them around so that they could make a comeback and further have authority over his own people Israel. He didn't like the people of Nineveh. Now uh, he he hated the people of Nineveh and he was quite concerned that if he would preach the word there they would repent and God would turn away from his anger. In his own words, he told the Lord, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. I knew that you're slow to anger and abounding in love, a, a God who relents from sending calamity. So when the Lord did relent and when he was gracious and generous to the people of Nineveh, Jonah wasn't surprised. He was angry with how generous God God turned out to be. What if I picture Living Savior as a growing church, mostly for people who agree with my politics, dress like I do, have so much in common with, with me that there's all kinds of things that I can talk about with them. What if I wouldn't mind if we didn't gain too many people that, that, that are different from me? Has Jonah's attitude taken hold in me? What if I question whether it's wise to send our missionaries to, to hostile places like Russia or, or Pakistan or Vietnam? What if I don't get very excited that Christianity is actually, actually exploding in growth in, in communist China and Hindu India and Muslim Pakistan? Has Jonah's approach become mine? What if I pray for the success of God's word among my own people with such energy and priority? I never pray that, that God would grant success to his word among people who are very different from mine and maybe even are a threat to my way of life. From time to time, there's a Jonah in each of us. Thank God there's a Jesus for each of us as well. You've observed how Jesus operated. He patiently corrected and instructed Israelite disciples who were pretty narrow-minded and short-sighted as, as far as who his Messiah work was intended for. On the cross, he presented himself as an acceptable sacrifice on behalf of those who can be kind of self-centered and unkind toward others. By word and sacrament, he keeps assuring me and you that our guilt for woefully misplaced priorities and, and self-centered views is, is atoned for. Then Jesus commissioned me and you and all of his followers to go and make disciples of, you heard it, all nations. He commissioned you and yours and me and, and, and mine to, to regard the work of, of our church locally and elsewhere as multi-ethnic, multi multicultural, international. To make that type of work the church's highest priority. Who knows? Might the preaching of God's word bear more fruit on continents other than our own? Might God actually have in mind that for the next fifteen year, in the next fifty years, the the Christian church will will prosper away from the United States? Might it actually happen that someday churches in Asia or Africa will be sending missionaries to the United States of America? That could certainly happen, couldn't it? You see, God's plan reaches far beyond the, the proud history of our nation. God sees far beyond the concerns of, of earthly governments and their citizens. At Jonah's time, he was concerned about the 120,000 children who were so young 
they couldn't tell their left hand from their right. He was also deeply concerned about their, their older brothers and sisters, their parents, their grandparents, their neighbors down the street. Like Jonah's fellow Israelites, all these souls were precious to the Heavenly Father. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, he actually turned them from their evil ways. In mercy, he had compassion and forgave and blessed them. What could possibly keep the Lord from being so generous with his grace that the church, the Christian church, prospers and grows in places and among cultures and among people that are very, very different from mine or yours. As we read, Wrong Way Jonah finally did go to Nineveh. He preached. They repented and believed. God relented. Jonah then went outside the city, built himself a shelter, to watch what was going to happen next. And what happened next was God caused a, a, a leafy vine to grow and, and provide shade for Jonah from the hot sun. And we're told Jonah was very happy with the vine. And then God sent a worm to destroy the, the vine so it withered up. Then he set a, sent a scorching east wind and the hot sun beat upon Jonah till he became faint. And finally toward, told the Lord he was just ready to give up and die. He didn't, of course. Not right away, at least. In fact, he lived long enough to write this account to show how stupid it is, how foolish it is, how selfish it, it is to be angry when God is generous with his grace toward other people. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank God for his, that his grace and compassion has included me and you and people like me and people like you that, that often we can gather with here on, on Sunday mornings. But thank God that his grace and compassion also includes people we, we might have a hard time communicating with because the, their language is different than ours. We might not enjoy their food. We might not enjoy their customs. We might not connect on any level except this. Sinners like us, they heard the word. They repented. They were baptized and forgiven of their sins. And they were brought into an everlasting church so that someday we can communicate with them very, very well in heavenly joy. God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth about Christ Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for all sorts of people to set all sorts of people from guilt over the way they've lived, from, from the, the burden of sadness over the way their life has gone, so that they might be turned back to him and repent. When that happens to people in another nation, of another culture, of another way of thinking, of another way of communi communicating, Praise God. Pray that some of them might become part of this living Savior church that we're a part of. But for the millions of others, pray that someday you can meet them and enjoy their company and celebrate God's generosity with them in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, pour out your Spirit on all of us so that we who are recipients of your grace would desire that many others would be welcomed into your family of believers. You are so generous that you gave your one and only Son so that we who are undeserving 
would be recipients of the eternal benefits he won for us through his life, his innocent sufferings and death, and his resurrection from the grave. Fill our hearts with your grace, Lord, that we would be abounding in mercy to all with whom we come in contact. Gracious God and Savior, watch over all who are suffering and sick. Strengthen those who are weak and afraid. Encourage and comfort those who are lonely and depressed. By your power, build us all up so that we would be an encouragement to others. We would spread your grace to those in need, and we would also support those who serve with us for your name's sake. Hear us also, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. On behalf of everyone here at Living Savior, we thank you for joining us today for this online service. To learn about more resources that we provide throughout the week in addition to Sunday mornings, please go to our website, lsavior.org. If you scroll down to the bottom, there's a registration form where you can sign up for our weekly emails. There are Bible studies, devotional resources, and outside safe events for families and youth that will be forthcoming in the weeks and months ahead. Also, we are so grateful to everyone who continues to support our ministry. If you would like to give a gift, you can do so online by going to lsavior.org give, where these gifts continue to support the ministry of spreading God's grace to not only those who are here in our church, but our surrounding communities. We also would like to connect with everyone online. You can fill out an online connect form by going to lsavior.org connect. You can fill out your name, your address, pastors and our pastoral intern, Tommy Welch. We're doing a lot of visiting, especially at a safe distance outside. If we can stop by and encourage you and pray with you in any way, please don't hesitate to let us do so. You can also fill out prayer requests on that Connect form as well. Again, on behalf of everyone here at Living Savior, God's richest blessings to you as you grow in grace and godly living. Take care. <laughs>